This week on Crossfeed. Church versus Train. Church versus Machete. Church versus North Dakota. Church versus the ACLU. And Church is Dying. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of CrossFeed. I am Dakota Joe, a.k.a. Pastor Jim Butler, out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Welcome, everyone. Yes, this week I've been uh, having vacation Bible school out here. We've had over 100 kids um, and just been having a great time and uh, the Dakota Joe is an Indiana Jones wannabe, and uh, so it's uh, been just a great time with uh, me and my little puppet digger, and we've just been having a great time, so uh, the hat's part of the outfit. Cool. And I have some good news. Uh, as of today, we have a phone number again you can call in. So we've been actually getting some feedback, which we're really excited about. And uh, But also, you can call us. And I'm going to give you that number right now, so if we say something amusing or offensive, you can call us on it. And that number is 206-350-4749. Now hopefully, he'll have that on the screen for you. Uh, or you can always write us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or use our Faith Speak page. We've actually gotten a second comment this week through our Faith Speak page, which is pretty cool. So um, we'll talk more about that and give a shout out to our uh, guy here in just a little bit. Well, where should we start tonight? It's ready for my phone to stop ringing. Ah, there we go. Machine will get it. Oh, let's start with the guy in the machete. Right. This is in Ghana. So, you know, part of understanding this story is understanding how churches work in uh, many parts of Africa. And this sounds like, and I don't know a lot about the uh, the Ghana church or churches. But I know that in Madagascar, they have uh, what they call tubis, where it's a, you go to a church, and it's not just a church, it's like a church-slash-hospital, or a church-slash-soup uh, uh, kitchen kind of thing, or something like that, where they, they're very much integrated with sort of holistic um, healing. We're not just going to... You know, it's sort of a, a Book of James kind of thing. You know, we're not just going to tell you the gospel. We're going to help you with your problems, whatever they are. So um, so this is a guy that was at a church, and he was there for healing. Uh, apparently, he was admitted for epilepsy. And because he was a bit dangerous, they had him tied up. Which, I mean, in the United States, that would be unheard of. I mean, you, you can't even... Um, I had a, a member of my congregation who was having some memory problems, and she just recently lost her ability to walk. But because her memory was bad, she, um, she'd be in the wheelchair, and forgot that she couldn't walk, and she would try to stand up and end up falling over. And, I mean, she could have gotten seriously hurt. Thankfully, she didn't. Um, so her daughter, who was her power of attorney, said, can you just put a little seatbelt on her as a, just a reminder? You know, they said, no, we can't do that because it would be unlawful restraint. But they don't have these problems in Ghana. You can tie the person up. I've seen pictures of people chained. Um, all kinds of things. So, anyway, this guy was uh, tied up and he was put in a room uh, while waiting to be treated and services going on in the other room in the sanctuary. Well, so he is in there for like 15 minutes and he manages to untie the rope. 
which they didn't think he'd be able to. And then he picked up a machete in the room, broke the door, and headed toward the pulpit, cutting short the prayer session as everybody, including the pastors, ran for cover. Do you Make see it. a problem with it? Make it even. <laughs> I'm thinking that the first problem here is that you have a dangerous person tied up in a room with a machete. I think a dangerous person maybe you want to take the machete out of the room. But that's just me. Any monkey business is ill-advised. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was just kind of interesting um, reading the whole thing that you know, they said that the you know that the, the the spiritual side they put on this, you know, that the man was an agent of Satan. Um, yeah. And, and, but they said it didn't kill him. He wanted to go around to other churches and kill other pastors too. It wasn't just this one place. He he really wanted to go all kinds of places. There's someone in my head, but it's not and, me. Um. So a a guy in his. They said a macho man church member. I so love that word, a church macho church. man. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> being from the 70s, my first thought was village people. Yeah, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> but I just, I mean, you're the one wearing the goofy hat. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's nothing goofy about this hat. Well. No, you look like you're ready to um, go to Ghana with a machete strap to you. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Too many snakes. Why did it have to be a snake? <laughs> anyway, um, they, uh, he said that he, they wanted to call in the police, but had a second thought because the whole issue was spiritual. Therefore, they prayed for the man. That's great, but I'm thinking, make sure he's locked up first, and then pray for him. When will this insanity end? You know, the thing that that you find here that's really interesting, because they said, uh, uh, after five minutes, the man put the machete on the seat I sat on before the macho man went to overpower him from behind. This is a quote from the Reverend. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a, a weird situation. And it, it just seems like in Africa, there's a lot more of... Because I've seen a lot of stories like this coming out of Africa. It makes you think that maybe in Africa it's a lot more like it was when Jesus was uh, walking the earth where you had all this demon possession and stuff like that going on. You know, because the devil can do that. And um, in, it, it's not to his benefit to do it in what we consider modern um, society or whatever um, in the Western world, because he does a lot better at creating atheists than um, than superstitious people. And so... Then, you know, we'll avoid the whole demon possession thing because if you want to destroy faith, you know, demon possession, people would go, oh, well, you know, maybe there is such a thing as the spiritual. In Africa, the spiritual is a given. And so it's, it seems like, well, since people believe in the spiritual anyway, then let's, uh, Devil figures must use the whole spiritual thing. It's interesting to me. His last paragraph too. He said that this uh, guy was later much much better after they had prayed for him and sent him back. You know, really, the story reminded me a little bit of the uh, gospel reading from last Sunday. This the the story of the garrison demoniac. You know, who was mm-hmm. under guard and in chains, and yet would break the chains, because they said one thing, they had no idea how the world got, the guy got the knots untied to get set free. Um, so it really reminded me yeah. of that story, reading through it. But uh, Well, of course, in America, we don't use machetes. 
We use lawsuits. Yeah, yeah that's our weapon of choice. And uh, that's more our weapon. And there's a couple of lawsuits that we came across this week. Yeah. Um, one of which is, um, I don't know, have you ever had any of the Dakota Boys Ranch uh, honey? <laughs> totally. Oh, yeah. Actually, I've got some in my cupboard right now. All right. Uh, Dakota Boys Ranch is a Lutheran ministry. It uh, was developed by the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, or one man from it. Uh, we actually had a Lutheran version of Father Flanagan. And Dakota Boys Ranch is the Lutheran version of Boys Town. That's, uh, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, and a lot of people have been sent there to, uh, a lot of kids have been sent to North Boys Ranch there in North Dakota. Uh, to for healing and things, and uh, well, unfortunately, somebody decided they didn't like it, um, and, and sued because it is Lutheran in its background, and it talks about uh, Jesus and how he brings healing to people, and so they uh, sued. Fortunately, I guess the judge said, you're crazy. Yeah. Supreme Court threw it out. So, I mean, this organization, the Dakota Boys Ranch, has been around since 1952. And so, it, it's not like this is some new upstart thing, but the it seems like the ACLU wanted to make this a, or I'm sorry, not the ACLU, the Freedom from Religion Foundation right. out of uh, my old hometown, Madison. So, um, they uh, decided that they, I think they wanted to make this a test case on the whole faith-based initiative, and it didn't work. It failed. They, they threw it out. Um, they said that you can't have a, a taxpayer organization. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't quite understand the. It, it said. Supreme Court ruled Monday that ordinary taxpayers cannot challenge a White House initiative that helps religious charities get a share of federal money. I have no idea what that meant. So, I mean, the idea behind this whole faith-based initiative is that, you know, we've got all these religious organizations that are helping people out. And so, you know, why is it that the government can support financially atheist organizations but not religious organizations. And um, and so I said, if they're helping people, we want to support that work that they're doing. And the money can ultimately be used for the, for the um, social service uh, stuff. They can't use it for any kind of proselytizing or anything like that. Well, the Court of the Boys Ranch certainly is Christian, although they don't have to um, nothing's forced on them. They're not forced to go to church or anything like that and uh, practice the religious camp. Or, you know, there's there's concessions made so that it's not shoved down anybody's throat. But it's there. I mean, it's a it's a Lutheran organization, so it's going to have Christian, you know, Lutheran teachings. You know, sometimes I amaze even myself. Right. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed. Uh, I, I mean. <laughs> We joke about the honey because one of the things that they do there is um, raise bees. And then from the bees, they bring honey. I guess that's um, going to really help them learn patience and understanding because you don't want to get angry with a bunch of bees. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that's a kind of a unique part of their therapy. And it's, from everything I've read, it's, a very good organization, and it does great work. Um, what I would say is, though, that somebody, the parents, or somebody has to okay, you know, that my son is going there, or my daughter's there, because they also have programs for girls as well. I would not want to have a... Uh, if it was my kid, I mean, I wouldn't want my my, my children to be in a Muslim-based um, program right. or a um, I don't know, uh, Muslim-based program or a uh, Hindu-based program. 
So I think, you know, they need to have an option. This is a, this is the kind of the base of this program. You have the right to opt out, you know, and go to something else. Right. We'll find something else for you instead. Right. We'll find something else for you instead. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, there are a lot of therapy programs where religion is not even a part of it. It might as well be an atheistic program. Mm-hmm. You're not even permitted to really talk to the kids. Even if the kid brings it up, you're, you're supposed to, you know, walk away from the subject. And uh, I have a friend of mine who uh, does uh, works in group home, worked in a group home, and you know they were told him flat out if the kid brings even if the kid brings it up, walk away from it. Say I can't talk to you about about that, which was very frustrating for him and for them because they they often had questions and they knew he was uh, a strong member of a church and they wanted to know what does God think. So, uh, I think overall, I kind of like the faith-based initiative, uh, because I think it, it's a great idea. And what happened with the Supreme Court there is that, you know, um, this this came out of the um, White House uh, that allowed these things, this, this federal money to go to faith-based organizations. And so, um, you know, they wanted to stop it, and they said, well, can't do it. Just because you pay taxes doesn't always give you standing to sue. Now, I imagine what this would be is, if somebody was going to complain about it, it would have to be like um, one of the parents or something like that. I imagine they could probably sue um, if they felt that they were being forced into something or, or something like that. You know, I, I was happy to see this because basically they said, um, you know what, Legislation is not supposed to happen in the Supreme Court, right? You know, and that's that's basically what this is saying. I was thrilled about that. Um, the uh, uh, judge Alito said uh, taxpayers in the case set out a parade of horribles that they claimed could occur unless the court stopped the Bush administration initiative. Uh, of course, none of these things has happened. All right. Well. And we have to understand, too, who are some of the largest social service or organizations in the country? Catholic Charities. The largest network in the country. Believe it or not, you probably don't. Everybody thinks it's Catholic Charities. It's not. It's Lutheran Services of America. The Lutheran Service Association of America. It's actually Lutheran. Um, and um, I happen to be wearing my T-shirt from my uh, from our local affiliate, Lutheran Social Services of New England. Uh, and LS, uh, LSS runs group homes for boys and girls, um, a home for unwed mothers, um, various um, one or two um, nursing homes, uh, all these different mission ministries and things to people, uh, helping, and a lot of it funded by federal and state dollars. And well, if it would be illegal, um, we'd have to shut it down. Yeah, the back when uh, that tsunami hit over in Indonesia, and the the U.S. government had a list of sort of recommended relief organizations, and one of the organizations was Lutheran World Relief. Yep, uh, fact, that was the only um, religious organization on the list. Uh, Lutheran World Relief was the very last organization to pull out of Oklahoma. After the uh, Oklahoma City disaster, uh, they stayed to the very, you know, until everything was taken care of with people. It's, it's, so, you know, and by the way, we have a very good track record in terms of how much money goes to, um, administration. I think it's less than 1%. It's just a very, very small amount. So, I mean, I'm justifiably very proud of our organization, uh, our, our social ministry. And I really don't appreciate the Freedom From Religion Foundation wanting to come in and say, you can't do that anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I look at this and say, you know what? Instead of spending all your money and all this ridiculous lobbying and lawsuits and all that kind of stuff, why don't, you, why don't you show that you can do it better? You know, why don't you start up uh, an atheist, a specifically atheist organization, uh, anti-religious organization or whatever, that goes around helping people instead of getting in the way and trying to stop others from helping people. Right. Anyway, 
And we go from the Freedom of Found it, Freedom from Religion Foundation to uh, the cohorts and AC, uh, the ACLU down in Louisiana, where there is a courthouse that has an interesting thing. When I read this and it said that a picture of Jesus, I thought it was going to be like Solomon's head of Christ. No, this is an Eastern Orthodox icon. Yeah. And um, and he's holding a Bible open in written in Greek, and then underneath in English it says, "Obey these, and you will live, or you will have peace." And one of them is, "Judge not, lest you be judged." The other is talking from John about judging rightly. So that's both dealing with this idea of judging rightly, but it's just uh, this Greek, and, and of course the ACLU sees this, and you know its heart goes a flutter, and you know, and, and and begins to having you know palpitations there because. There's this picture of Jesus on a courthouse, and people are going to think, unless you're Christian, you're not going to get any, you know, real um, justice in this court. Forget about the fact that Moses' picture is in the Supreme Court in the United States, you know, so. Oh, it's not just his picture. It's a, sta- I mean, he's like, he's part, it's a sculpture that is part of the building. I mean, you couldn't remove it with, without taking out part of the wall. It's a um, yeah. It's well, it's a Greek or it's a, it's a Greek Orthodox icon. You just have to understand what those look like, and if you understand what an Orthodox icon looks like, it you know exactly. Yeah, you do have to take out part of the wall to get rid of it. Um, but what a once again, it's just like now. What happened was is um, the, uh, the, the 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 court said, well, we we want to spend some more time looking this over. They haven't really figured out what they're going to do yet. But again, you know, what I thought was interesting is that the ACL wrote a letter and released it to the news media the same day. And uh, the people down there in uh, Louisiana weren't real happy about that. I don't think you're happy enough. Yeah, they're, uh, it, it, it's kind of weird because nobody really knows how old the picture got there. You know, it's one of those things that, well, oh, it's just always been there, you know. And uh, nobody knows who put it there, why they put it there, you know, anything like that. It's just, it's always been there. And nobody cared until, you know, the ACLU got word of it, and all of a sudden, it's a big deal. I wasn't thrilled with the quote, the to know these obey these laws. Because it sounded really works righteousy to me. I mean, it it, it you know, if you if you're good, then you'll have peace. And I suppose from a I guess from a, a a judgment sense in the sense of well, uh, it's like that that passage in Romans I think it is where Saint Paul says that uh, if you if you're not a lawbreaker. Then you you don't need to be you don't need to fear the government or I forget exactly how it's worded but basically you don't have to worry as long as you obey the law. Well, you know, I mean, if you if you think about it, okay, it's John seven twenty four. Uh, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Uh, and then Matthew seven is for what for the judgment that ye. Uh, for with the judgment you use, you also will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be also measured to you. You think about it, I mean, in a court of law, those make perfect sense. Maybe quoted kind of out of context a little bit, but yeah, it really does, you know, I think it can be a legitimate application. Um, and yeah, under the terms of idea of if you're really going to find peace in this court, if they're going to find, you know, judgment, real judgment, then, yeah, obey these words. You know, be careful what you, you know, don't, you know, real, judge justly. Um, so, you know, I think the, yeah. whoever put it in there really thought of, you know, he knew exactly what he was doing. Impressive. Uh, I, you know, and I can't, I would think that the ACLU couldn't really argue with the sentiment behind it. You know, this whole idea that, you know, all right, you judges, you better be just in your judging because, you know, someday you might be on the other side of the bench. Right. And, you know, so you want true justice to prevail uh, for your own benefit. But they don't care. Um, 
They don't right. care they about don't the setup. The idea behind it. Yeah. It's that Jesus is there, and I think they actually do say that, you know, somewhere over here it does say that only, you know, the, 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 the picture idea is that only Christians will be given um, justice in there, in the courthouse. Um, which I think is a little crazy considering it's a Greek Orthodox icon. And how many Greek Orthodox people do you think they have in Louisiana? <laughs> I can't do that many. <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's Baptist territory. Yeah. Maybe so, Dakota Joe needs to go down there and do some hunting around for them Greek Orthodox people down there, you know. <laughs> I, I might need to dig them out here and there, you know. It's like kind of hidden. <laughs> Ain't too many of them. You can't hide from them. And you just have to look for those old temples. I guess. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I keep saying Greek Orthodox. It's actually Russian Orthodox. It's a Russian Orthodox oh. icon. So um, I also want to get that correct. So... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, I said though it's no, been there ever no, since no. the courthouse opened in 1997. I would think it, although I would think some 11 years ago they, you know, they would know how it got there. It's not, it's not like it's you know 110 years ago. It's ancient history or anything. Not like they, yeah. you know, gotta you know go out and dig up some artifact or something to find it out. I think there'd be somewhere in a file from. But we are talking about Louisiana. Uh? Where are you going with that? Oh, well, I mean, you know, we, we are talking about one of the most corrupt state governments in the country. You know, oh, okay. I mean, where they, you know, elected a, you know, where their their uh, governor was a convicted felon. You know, I mean, it's, you know, oh, yeah. It's time we face up to the unface up to a vote. He's one of the few um, public officials not running for president right now. <laughs> but he'd probably get elected in Louisiana if he had. Ay, 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 ay. I wonder, though. Of course, now Louisiana, you know, that's home of New Orleans, where they have a very high water table. Uh, and they do have that beautiful cathedral. What, what is the cathedral there in New Orleans? St. John's Cathedral? Oh. I know what it is. I was... I was there walking around the, uh, one day, and they have all the different uh, people right outside the cathedral doing all the different performing, all the street performers and stuff out there, and it's just a beautiful area. But because of the high water table, of course, they could never build something underneath it, which takes us to Barcelona, where there is, you know, I thought they spent a long time working on the Jerusalem Temple. Yeah, but there is the the Temple of the Holy Family, by uh, designed by on Antoni Gaudi, uh, which been working on since 1818, almost 200 years, and they've been working to raise the money to finish this guy's really grand uh, architectural masterpiece here, and now they're wanting to put a high speed train underneath it. And some of these people are not happy and they're trying to divert the tunnel away from the site. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're talking about this big stone architecture and you imagine the vibrations from, you know, high speed train. That's not a good thing. Well, it depends. I mean, okay, I, 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 have you ever been to Quebec? Um, no. No. I, I, I mean, it's really wild. You go down there, and there's a shopping mall underneath the city. Yeah. And, you know, and there are subway, uh, the subway system going completely underneath. I mean, come on. I live in Massachusetts. I mean, Boston is famous for its, you know, landfill soil. You know, landfill, you know, Boston is two-thirds landfill. It used to be very mm -hmm. hilly, and they just scraped it flat and dumped all the... Uh, mountain, all the hills into the um, uh, to Boston Harbor and b built out the city. And you know we we got subways going underneath. We've got our highway going underneath the city. So I don't. Th I, I'm not. I wouldn't be so worried about that myself. I mean, you can do things to putting e uh, 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 different kinds of uh, 
wheels and stuff underneath the train to help keep those vibra- vibrations down. I think you can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, as one of the guys says, uh, this project meets the highest technical standards and the safety of the surroundings is guaranteed. Don't be too proud of this technological terror. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's maybe it's a question of uh, using the, the property or, you know, just the whole idea that this is. We don't want to anything that's going to cause a problem for. Well, it's interesting they have a, a, a comment on on this article by a guy who used to live who lives just a few blocks away from the temple. He said, you know, you know, Barcelona is has the seas and the mountains. So, uh, in order to you know have the stations, it either has the track either has to go by the temple. Um, where there's already two tunnels for metro stations, or along the sea, and they said, you know, this this is would be the best one and the and the and the safest one. Hmm. Yeah. So, I don't. I mean, personally, I don't totally understand the whole property thing. I mean, because I would think that you know, this almost sounds like those eminent domain kind of deals. Um. I'm not sure when you buy a plot of land or when you own a plot of land, um, how far down does your uh, do you purchase? You know, can they can they dig underneath you? Do they have the right to do that if it's your property without you know, compensating you in some way? Or well, I, it's going to go underneath it, so you don't need to be you know generally compensated for what goes underneath your property. I yeah, know. as long as it doesn't cause any disruption. So, but of course, but the funny uh, thing is, the same time, speaking of property, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, oh, but the funny thing, of course, is that they found out they've been working on the sucker for 125 years without a building permit. <laughs> Oops. It's, it's kind of expired. They never had one. I am not on the committee! Yeah, well, maybe they can work out a deal that the, the city will say, well, I'll tell you what, we won't fine you for the, you know, or we won't charge you the, the back pay on the building permit yeah. um, in exchange for being able to build down there. Well, the other thing that gets me is that they, it's supposed to have the star-shaped plaza, uh, which would mean... Um, Raising houses and shops and evicting 150 family. Um, and they expect the town hall, which is the one that they don't want to put this rail line there, to pay for that expansion and for the rehousing costs. Hey, man, this don't feel right. My donkey senses are tingling all over. Methinks they doth, they doth ask for too much. Yeah. I have a problem with anybody um, evicting families so that they can build without, you know. I mean, that's that's a whole other issue, but that that whole eminent domain thing um, that happened when I was up in uh, up at the church in Amherst, Wisconsin. Uh, they were redirecting the highway, and it was necessary. I mean, there was accidents happening constantly. It was, uh, Bloody Highway 10 or something like that was called. And, uh, so they wanted to, to redo the highway. Well, it was going to go right past. They were going to cut through, right through this farmer's land and, um, basically making this property impossible to work on. And, um, it would just kill the, um, the. Concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. The property values. The people that at the time, you know, originally were really far from the highway. It was nice and quiet and everything. You could sit there and listen to the birds and everything. And all of a sudden, they were going to have a highway going through their backyard. And then the um, all the towns that were right on the highway, little cafes and stuff like that, uh, where people would, off the highway would stop for meals. It was going to hurt all their businesses. Um, but I mean, the biggest thing was they were people were told, "Look, 
you're going to, um, you're going to have to move because we need this property. And then, oh, I've been living here for, you know, my family's been here for 150 years or whatever. And, oh, well, sorry. Um, you can either take what we offer you on the property, uh, or we'll just condemn it. So, the whole thing bothers me. And if the church is trying to get them to do something like that, I've got a real problem with that. Huh. It's a, I thought I was just, a, yeah, I, I had a real problem with the way that was being done. Um, I mean, if you want to, if you want to go over and offer the people money for their house and buy it and tear it down, and do whatever, fine, go ahead. But, you know, don't expect the town hall to help with the, you know, rehousing and everything. You know, that's, that's not, uh, that's, that shouldn't be done. Uh, I had some real problems with, uh, you know, uh, that I've seen this, or seen this happen, where they've condemned houses and torn them down so they could put in a shopping mall or something. Uh, that's, that's, that alone a church. Oh, that is nasty! Well, let's go That's north of the border. Up to Canada. And this, I thought, was... It was interesting that you chose this article. But for most of you guys don't know, Dale pretty much picks the articles each week that we're going to be you know, reviewing. And uh, I happened to see this one on the site. And I was thinking, I, yeah, I need to email Dale and tell him I want to do this story. And I never did, but you picked it anyway. So I was very pleased. Basically, what they discovered is, and this just this is a, a continues a, like a fifty year trend of finding out the same information again and again and again that the more liberal a church becomes, the fewer people who go to it. And this is uh, out of Canada, and they're finding the same thing as. Uh, they're becoming more accepting of uh, gay marriage, uh, abortion, and other things. Their attendance has plummeted. We've talked about this concept before, but here's the um, the, the definite. Here's the numbers you know, to back it up. Uh, the Anglican Church in Canada from 1961 to 2001 has, has dropped in numbers by 53 percent. From 1.36 million to 642,000, losing on average 13,000 members a year. Uh, the United Church of Canada, which is the Canadian version of the United, the American United Church of Christ, and um, used to be Canada's largest Protestant church, suffered a loss of 39 percent to its members, from 1.04 million to 638,000, and um, and then those among the, that actually have church membership, most of them don't attend regularly. Uh, Presbyterian church membership, which was the person that wrote this article, was part of, dropped by 35%. Baptist down 7%, Lutheran's 4 So, you know, I was, I was reading this and I was thinking about, all right, what is one of the most conservative churches in the United States, which, you know, I'm more familiar with in Canada. The um, Assemblies of God, they're growing like crazy, I mean, numerically. You know, so what's the difference, right? These churches, these liberal churches, have basically thrown out the Word of God, and they're um, basically, they're not telling you anything that you won't hear on MTV. Well, if that's all people are going to hear when they go to church. Why go to church? It's, uh, well, the other thing, too, I would say about uh, the Assembly of God is that not only they're more biblical, but they're also, um, what would the word be? Uh, they are also um, experiential. Which, yeah. you know, grabs a lot of people. Um, it, it's good to see that the, the Lutherans have only go down 4%. I mean, um, although the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada uh, is considerably more liberal than the uh, Lutheran Church Canada, our partner church up there. 
So it'd be kind of interesting right. to see how, how that gets divided between those two denominations. Um, but it's a – this has been going on since the 1960s. Uh, Dean Kelly then wrote his book called uh, Why Conservative Churches Are Growing. And he was asked to do this by the National Council of Churches, the, the liberal mainline group, which discovered then. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, I read the book The Empty Church, which talked about the same thing, how these you know, things are just – the membership of mainline churches is just plunging. And you're absolutely right, you know. What do they have to, you know, what do they have to offer? I remember yeah, Ray, exactly. um, my sister-in-law was looking for a church. Uh, she and, actually my brother's first wife, but I still call her my sister-in-law. Anyway, so she and her husband, her, her second husband were looking for a church. And so they started off at, you know, they didn't know anything. So they went to this United, Christ church, United church of Christ congregation. The, the sermon of the day. Why you should join a union. <laughs> okay. Well, that's pretty scriptural. Yeah. I've got a book uh, up on my shelf, by, a book of sermons by a UCC pastor. And out of uh, John 9, the story of the man born blind, he has a sermon. Now, this is from the 1980s, okay? So... You, why you should be against capital punishment and for a nuclear freeze. Uh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember Jesus talking about that when people came and, and said, oh, Jesus, you know, who sinned this man or his parents? And Jesus said, this man is blind because of nuclear proliferation. Right. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I kept the book only because... A, I wonder, still don't wonder to say how he got from A to B, and two, what never to do in a sermon. <laughs> now, stay away from your pet peeves. Talk about Jesus and the gospel, his death and his resurrection. That's what it's all about. And so this was just a really... Uh, I remember a guy from a, a Lutheran church in Rockford, Illinois. And he was from one of the ELCA churches. And he was going to start going to a friend of mine's church. This friend of mine happened to be the Wisconsin Synod, uh, his congregation. And uh, so um, the Wells pastor, this guy had been coming about eh, about a month, six, month and a half. And um, mm. so he thought, well, yeah, maybe I better go, but, you know, I think I'll go visit this guy. You know, I'll get one of a sheep steal or anything. So so he went over and talked to the guy and, and stuff. And he said, well, what, what brought you here and stuff? And he goes, well, you know, Pastor, he says, the pastor over there at, at the other congregation, he preaches a pretty good sermon. But you seem to say what the Bible says. A God blind brilliant! Yeah. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> so, you know, I... Well, I, one of my members who actually hadn't been attending, moved, and um, decided to check out the churches in the area she was at. So um, she checked out a Presbyterian Church USA congregation. And first of all, a woman pastor, which kind of caught her off guard a bit, but okay, you know, familiar with that. And she said, then this, during her sermon, she basically um, denounced the Trinity. <laughs> she said, I'll be going back there. <laughs> so, yeah, and this is in rural Iowa. You just wonder how these people even manage around here. But, you know, people sit there and, and they hear this stuff. Like, What's going on here? But, you know, at the same time, a lot of people's attitude is, well, this too shall pass, you know, we'll stick it out with the church or, or maybe go away um, for a while until this person's gone. Uh, you know, the church has been here longer than they than they have and it will be long after they're gone. You know, that's, a lot of people see it that way. So. Yeah, the problem is the next person is going to be just like them. 
Because right. if you look at the ELCA, the right, that's what they're teaching in the seminary. That's what they're learning. When I was at Gordon Conwell, uh, there was a um, guy across the hall, and he had all this Lutheran stuff on his door. And so I knocked on it and I went over. He was an MDiv student from the ELCA, but he wanted to go to a biblical seminary. Hmm. And I'm like, so what are you doing here in Reformville? And I want to get all these guys for your MDiv and stuff. And I said, well, why don't you come to, you know, Concordia, one of the Concordias? He's like, well, and this was really sad. He said, well, I looked into it, but they wouldn't accept me because I wanted to stay in the ELCA. Good grief. And um, so it just so happened we had our district convention. And uh, one of the pros from Fort Wayne was out, who was also a vice president of the Senate at the time. And I went over and I said, hey, I want to tell you about the situation, that I, the conversation I just had. He, and he listened. He whips out his card. He goes, have him call me. We'll see what we can do. Uh, you know, because my view was, is, you know, as a, as a Missouri Senate pastor, I'm very proud of our theological tradition. I'm very proud of our conservative, biblical, ba- Lutheran-based approach to things in our education. Uh, we should open up the doors to guys, yeah. people from the ELCA, even if they want to remain there. Uh, matter of fact, when I was yeah. there, we actually had a guy who was um, uh, associated with an LCA Slavic uh, group. This is before the ELCA was formed, and he was going to go back there. And, but, you know, they had, you know, worked things out because he wanted a biblical, confessional basis for his education. Well, you know, what it comes down to is if they don't get confessional pastors in there, it's not going to get any better. Right. It's just going to keep spiraling downhill because everybody's just going to leave. It's like there was the ELC pastor um, up in Amherst that... And he said, uh, you know, I was talking to him about, oh, we were talking about that uh, joint declaration on doctrine and justification between the ELCA and the Roman Catholics. And uh, he said, you know, it really bothers me because uh, it, which if you push doctrine under the rug and say that our differences don't matter, then they're never going to get fixed. And, um, you know, I said, Man, what are you doing in the ELCA? Well, his wife was co-pastor, so that's part of it. But um, but he said, well, you know what? I believe that um, you know there was there was a big part of it that used to be very biblical, and I believe that if all of the conservative pastors leave, then there's no hope for it. But I still believe that there is some hope for it if enough people stand up for the truth. So I said, no, I can't argue with that. Yeah, oh, they got the Word Alone group. They got the Lutheran Corps. Um, they've got um, three or four other cons- moderate conservative groups. Uh, matter of fact, um, the St. Louis Seminary uh, issued kind of a formal letter to them inviting them to come on to the St. Louis campus for STM and PhD studies and MA yeah. studies. Um, and said, you know, yeah, we're even willing to have conversations about women clergy and tell you where we're coming from. Which means, you know, we still think it's wrong, but, you know, if you want to come and get a Master of Arts in Religion or get a Ph.D., um, well, well, it's a graduate school, so we can't say no to you anyway, but at least this way you'll have some good biblical background. Uh, and uh, Well, they're not ordaining them either, you know. Right. Because that's one of the problems. So, you know, I mean... Some of the, the churches, like the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America and some others, um, they come out of, um, they get a lot of their pastors out of like Fuller Seminary and Gordon Conwell, Trinity Divinity School. So they get some evangelical guys coming in, and, and women, as far as that matter. Um, keeps them from going wholesale downhill. But within, for example, the ELCA, they, they pretty much take it from just their seminary. So uh, there's almost not much you can they can do. Um, matter of fact, if you're in the, the seminary, it's, it's, it's very different from our system. Uh, the, 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 the local district, uh, what they call synod, monitors your progress the whole time. And to a certain extent, make sure your thinking is orthodox, which means 
Liberal. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, so, uh, found out about that. We had a seminary interview committee with a guy and who had gone uh, up to his vicarage and then just said, I can't stand this. Well, I, he came to the conclusion, I can't handle this. And they came to the conclusion, we really don't want you. Uh, and so he found him coming to St. Louis and coming to Missouri. And I think he lost an entire year of credit doing it. Yeah. I asked him how he thought about that. He goes, that's okay. I want to I want to relearn all this anyway. I suppose. So. Yeah, this, this story reminds me of the church that I vicared at up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. They, um... Green Bay. That shirt. Yeah. Only the Packers. Never got to go to a game. And, uh, so they, the past, it was a big church. I mean, it's like 1,200 members, something like that, and growing. And, uh, and it had started out when the pastor got there like 25 years ago. Um, it was down to like 50 because the pastor that was in there before was doing things like, requiring tongue speaking for confirmation and just all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but uh so anyway, I mean the church was, was doing very well and uh and he got this questionnaire um that was sent out to large churches and it was kind of like what's your secret or whatever. And uh he says, I preach the gospel in its purity and rightly administer the sacraments. That was his answer. So, but I... I think it also... I think it had something to do with the fact that it was in a, a growing neighborhood and uh, the fact that every time somebody visited the congregation, they got a visit from, well, usually the vicar, actually, either the vicar or the pastor, within, like, 48 hours or something like that of when they visited. So I think that probably had something to do with it, too. It probably did. Now, the only reason I, I throw that out is, you know, um, and I've seen it, two pastors preaching the same message, you know, within five miles of each other. One church is growing and doing great things. The other church is dying on the vine. And, uh, you know, so a lot of times it's, you know, they're, and it's funny because one talked to one pastor said, well, why is your church declining? Oh, these people don't want to hear the people don't want to hear the truth. Their hearts are hard. They don't want to listen to it. So I went to the other guy. Why is your church growing? People are hungry for the truth. They don't have any. You know, I was like, <laughs> Have you talked to this guy over here? <laughs> <laughs> have you talked? <laughs> you know, um, because it was just a really odd that one. You know. But they both pointed to the truth that they were preaching as the reason one church was growing and the other church was declining. <laughs> so, I often wonder what are some of those um, most intangibles. Yeah, well, you know, it could be how friendly the congregation is. You know, it could be... I mean, there's a million different reasons why people will choose one congregation over another or, um, you know... It could be just because people are being invited. We've got a, the most recent family that joined our congregation. They were looking for the LCMS church, um, the next city down. Um, and they took a wrong turn and found ours and, and actually thought that they were at the, I mean, they, they thought, oh, this must be it. <laughs> we're closer to where they live. Yeah. So, um, so, but they didn't even know we were there. So they, they kind of stumbled on us by accident. So, great family. But, you just, you never know. But, uh, diluting your doctrine, not a good way to try, I guess, your go. That's some crude statistics. Too. Right. I mean, that's, that's the thing is, that I'm going to tell you right now, if you try, if you're going to sit here and say, guess what, man, uh, uh, we're going to grow because we're going to loot our, t our doctrine, forget it. Matter of fact, why even, why even keep your doors open? Why don't you just close them and right. say, we're done? Yeah. Because yeah. I see no reason to keep, to, to, to keep a church open. I, I like being a, 
uh, fairly conservative, biblical-based, gospel-preaching Lutheran pastor. So, well, that's it for our story tonight. Uh, if you would like to send us feedback, well, we actually we got some feedback this week. Uh, this is from Jeremy over at Faith Speak. So he sent us a message through our Faith Speak page. He says, "Hey guys, I've been listening to your podcast consistently for a couple of months now." Apart from a few denominational discrepancies, I really enjoy your show. It's nice to hear people doing podcasts who genuinely, genuinely sound like they enjoy doing it. We do. Um, thanks for the plug for Faith Speak on your most recent podcast. I'd like to dialogue with you sometime to find out more about the Lutheran denomination. My grandfather is Lutheran and my grandmother converted to Lutheran from Catholicism upon marrying my grandfather. Apart from that, the rest of my family has never claimed a denomination. I'll keep up the enjoyable podcast and welcome to Faith Speak and God bless Jeremy. So, Jeremy, thank you for uh, for your message. We really appreciate it. We'd love to uh, talk to you anytime um, about what we believe. And I imagine you've probably gotten a, a pretty good sense of it just from listening to us. But if you have specific questions, and not just Jeremy, anybody else, uh, if you have questions about why we um, said what we said, or uh, or something like that, or um, for that matter, if you you know if we said something that you say, boy, it's good to hear somebody finally saying that, or you know whatever it is, we'd love to get your feedback. And so you can again, you can call us at two zero six three five zero four seven four nine, or you can email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com or if you're watching this video in iTunes, you can just click on the window right now and it'll take you to the feedback page at crossfeednews.com where you can fill out a, uh, um, a feedback message there or you can go to our website crossfeednews.com and click on send us a voice message and and let us uh, and record it with your computer or you can go to our Facebook page. There's a lot of different ways to get a hold of us. And uh, we really don't have any preference. We just love hearing from you because we like to know. Um, you know, that, that's one of the great things about podcasting is that that feedback, just hearing from the listeners. I mean, Jim and I do this because we enjoy doing it. But, man, every time I get a feedback message, that just makes my day. I'm just floating for the rest of the day. It's really... Um, just love hearing from people. It is awesome. We won't have a podcast next week because of uh, various things, among them July 4th, uh, taking place the day before. Um, so you all have a fa- safe and enjoyable 4th of July. And the Lord grant you, um, remember what Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. But don't use your freedom to... Build up the flesh. Rather, let's serve one another in love. If we can keep that in mind as our theme for our Independence Day celebrations, I think we've got it all together then. Good night, everybody. God bless you. Good night.